Part 5. Corruption In 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev became the General Secretary of the Communist Party and the political climate in the Soviet Union changed. The new leader's passion and vigor emboldened reform-minded citizens across the country. Kalugin, too, felt a new sense of optimism as he embarked on a personal mission fighting corruption among government officials in his region. He soon found that the problem was much larger, with roots much deeper than he had expected. Corruption was already a concern in the Soviet Union in 1962 when Nikita Khrushchev noted in a speech, We can and must put an end forever to bribery and other disgraceful phenomena. Due to peculiarities in the Soviet Union's planned, centralized economy, by the 1980s, corruption was widespread throughout Soviet society. By then, black and gray markets were fixtures of daily life, as the availability of even basic commodities was unpredictable. Hard currency, which facilitated large purchases like cars and real estate, was strictly controlled. There was a ready supply of operators for the black market. The gulag prison system that had incarcerated an estimated 18 million Soviets under Stalin had produced a unified, hardened class of criminals skilled in managing unconventional supply chains. Due to low salaries, bribery and embezzlement were commonplace and often overlooked, and Kalugin recognized the vulnerability it created for national security. If a store manager or shop clerk takes a bribe, even a million rubles, it doesn't matter to me while I'm on this job. But when a law enforcement officer takes even 10 rubles, this is a crime that has to be punished. His first investigation involved allegations that the assistant prosecutor in Gatchina was accepting bribes to cancel criminal investigations. Kalugin and his team bugged the man's office, and within weeks they collected ample evidence to convict him. Next. His team got a lead about local mafia in the Slancy region bribing officials to turn a blind eye while they stole shipments of imported Finnish goods intended for miners in the area. The investigation was almost blown. It turned out that Lev Zykov, now the secretary of the Communist Party Central Committee, had a sister who tipped off the local mafia. Nonetheless, a handful of convictions were made. Finally, the team investigated allegations that businessmen were bribing Leningrad officials to sell them large quantities of lumber for low prices. Once shipped to southern Soviet republics, the wood was resold for massive profits. Three million rubles in bribes had changed hands by the time dozens of businessmen were arrested. Now, Kalugin wanted to go after the officials involved. As Kalugin laid out his plans to his superiors, he got the first sense that his investigation was running aground. Kalugin explained that. The men we arrested are just businessmen who paid bribes to get the lumber. It's the ones that let them have the timber illegally and take the bribes who are the real culprits, and they're still sitting in their offices in the party committee and the local government. Those are the ones who sold the power entrusted to them by the people. Gennady Voshinin, the regional party official in charge of law enforcement, replied, You want more blood? I'm sorry. I can't help you. Soon, Kalugin's chief investigators were facing trumped-up charges, such as extortion, jewel theft, and wife-beating. Getting no cooperation from his leadership, Kalugin attempted to contact the prosecutor general in Moscow. He got no response, and his leadership was furious. Next, Kalugin was attacked personally. A special investigation team made up of high-ranking officials badgered Kalugin's friends and acquaintances, trying to intimidate them to make negative statements about him. The investigation against Kalugin came to nothing, but so too was the lumber investigation over. Over the next couple of years, until his retirement, Kalugin was shuffled between dead-end postings, first at the Academy of Sciences, and then the Ministry of Electronics. Kalugin retired in 1990. He left Lubyanka, the KGB headquarters in Moscow, for the last time and made his way to the Institute of History and Archives. There he met with Yuri Afanasyev. Afanasyev was a leader of the growing democratic movement in the Soviet Union. Kalugin's second life as an activist had begun. Corruption, Russian Federation. In the early years of the Russian Federation, little deterred the crime and corruption engulfing the new country. After lifetimes in a state-controlled economy, there was little to prepare Soviet citizens for the Wild West capitalism that followed. Because of their prior experience with the free market, those best adapted to the new environment were corrupt officials, organized criminals, and the first generation of oligarchs, savvy, well-connected technocrats who made their fortunes buying devalued state enterprises. Criminal groups, 
thrived in the 1990s. Businesses of all sizes were targeted for extortion. The black market was flooded with public property, and bribery, intimidation, and even assassination of public figures was common. Criminal groups often had close, interdependent ties with the government, and by the mid-90s many criminal groups were budgeting as much as 50% of their income to bribe officials. It was not unusual for criminals to run for political office because of the legal immunity it offered. The Russian Federation had endured years of turmoil when Vladimir Putin became president in 1999. To the Russian public, Putin was a strong, stable leader worthy of their confidence. To all appearances, the unbridled chaos of the 90s was gone, but far from disappearing, corruption and criminality are now embedded functions of the Russian government, essential for keeping the peace among the country's real power brokers, top officials, organized criminals, and the oligarchs. According to Russian Federal Law No. 273, corruption is the abuse of official duties, giving and receiving a bribe, abuse of authority, commercial bribery, or other illegal use by an individual of his official position contrary to the legitimate interests of society and the state to obtain benefits. Members of the public still encounter traditional bureaucratic corruption. In 2015, a survey of 2,000 Russian citizens from 52 regions found that almost one in five had been asked for a bribe or given one to public authorities in the past year for health care, housing, judicial services, education, tax, etc. These scattered instances are often overlooked by authorities in exchange for loyalty from the corrupt official. More insidious are new forms of graft that Putin's government uses to enrich itself and reward its partners for loyalty. According to political scientist Noah Buckley, some of the most common forms include stealing government funds via overpriced contracts. For example, it is alleged that Boris and Arkady Rotenberg, close friends of Vladimir Putin, were among oligarchs who stole over $30 billion from the Sochi Olympics budget in 2014. Public auctions, in which participation is manipulated to include only insiders. Non-transparent accounting in state-owned companies, allowing profits to be shifted to private individuals and organizations. The Panama Papers, published in 2016, are a window onto the complex use of shell companies to move public money to private offshore accounts. It's believed that Vladimir Putin used this approach to amass his own fortune, estimated at $40 billion, making him one of the richest men in the world. The true cost of government corruption can be difficult to gauge until serious damage has occurred. A corrupt government loses the public's confidence and tarnishes its image abroad. It also places an invisible burden on the country's economy, making it harder to respond to emergency situations. This can be seen in the Russian Federation's handling of the COVID pandemic. An inconsistent, piecemeal response, a shortage of resources, and a public with low trust for its government resulted in the highest excess mortality rate in Europe between January 2020 and December 2021, according to the World Health Organization. Over one million more Russian citizens died than predicted. This included almost 500 doctors in the first six months of the pandemic, according to Russia's Federal Service for Surveillance and Healthcare. Conclusion This video series has examined factors that contributed to the collapse of the Soviet Union from the perspective of retired KGB General Oleg Kalugin's memoir, The First Directorate. These factors were also examined as they exist in the Russian Federation today. Like many countries around the world, the Russian Federation is at a crossroads. As it continues, its war in Ukraine, destroying schools, homes and hospitals, and killing thousands, the living conditions of its own population decline. Not just rights and freedoms, but health care, education and financial stability continue to erode. The only promise Vladimir Putin has made to his country is that more wars will follow. The window is closing swiftly. The time for Russian people to speak up about the future of their country is now.